good decision in the John Bolton bookcase. The judge was very powerful in his statements on classified information and very powerful also in the fact that the country will get the money, any money he makes. Uh, obviously, the book was already out. It leaked and everything else. But he leaked classified information, so he's got a big problem. President Trump yesterday celebrated a court ruling that denied his request to stop John Bolton's book from being published, but could open Bolton to legal troubles. Let's bring in our chief global affairs correspondent and this week co-anchor Martha Raddatz. Her exclusive interview with John Bolton airs tonight on ABC. So, Martha, that was a hell of an interview. Um, let, let me ask you, he, he's come under such fire, Bolton, for waiting so long to make these extraordinary allegations. But he tells you that he tried to raise the alarm repeatedly inside the Trump administration. Yeah, he, he says he raised the alarm inside the Trump administration, essentially felt he couldn't do any more. But of course, his critics say, why didn't he say all of these things during the impeachment hearings, especially after what he told me? Let's listen. You also used the phrase in the book that Trump's pattern looked like obstruction of justice as a way of life, which we couldn't accept. Obstruction of justice as a way of life? Look, these were things that I could see some evidence of, and they bothered me greatly. I talked to uh, the attorney general about them. I talked to the counsel to the president about them. I've talked to other members of the cabinet about them uh, and uh, relayed my concerns. And they, they were very much on my mind. Of course, he says, John, that the reason he didn't want to be in the part of the impeachment hearing is because he thought it was too politicized and he wouldn't make a difference. So he said, I pushed back on him several times in the interview this evening about how he would know whether he made a difference or not. All right, well, let's listen to another extraordinary clip from your interview where he basically sums up his feelings about President Trump. You described the president as erratic, foolish, behaved irrationally, bizarrely. You can't leave him alone for a minute. He saw conspiracies behind rocks and was stunningly uninformed. He couldn't tell the difference between his personal interests and the country's interests. I don't think he's fit for office. I, I don't think he has the competence to carry out the job. There really isn't any guiding principle uh, that I was able to discern other than uh, what's good for Donald Trump's reelection. Martha, we've just never heard something like that from at somebody in a president's inner circle while that president is still in office. I, and I think that's what you have to remember. This is an extraordinary interview, really a jaw-dropping interview, because he is talking about a sitting president. And he was there, as you know well, John, for 17 months. It wasn't like he was there for just a couple of months left in Rotatello. 17 months, and as you know well, he takes a lot of notes. John Bolton is a copious note taker. He is considered a foreign policy heavyweight, whether you agree with his foreign policy or not. It, it's really an extraordinary look in the White House. And in this White House, 17 months is an eternity, the longest serving so far national security advisor for President Trump. So we've heard President Trump push back, calling John Bolton a sick puppy, a wacko, saying his book is filled with lies. How is Bolton responding to all that? Well, Bolton says he will not respond to that. He said it's beneath uh, him to talk, or it's beneath the president to talk that way. Of course, we just heard him say the president was erratic and bizarre, so it's a little bit of a back and forth schoolyard fight. All right, Martha, thank you very much for bringing us that. The Room Where It Happened, an ABC News exclusive, airs tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern. Don't miss it. And John Bolton joins us now. Mr. Bolton, thank you for joining us this morning. Let's pick up where Mary just left off right there. If Democrats subpoena you, will you testify? Well, let, let's see what they decide to do. Look, let's be clear. Uh, the, the primary way that we uh, rein presidents in is not through impeachment. It's through elections. Uh, and presidential behavior can be reckless, reprehensible, dangerous, doesn't necessarily make it impeachable. I think one of the mistakes that the Democrats made, and uh, they made plenty, is the idea that everything is resolved through the impeachment process. And they mishandled it badly. I called it impeachment malpractice in the book. Uh, and, you know, what, what they do next uh, obviously but, is up to them. But you also said that a Senator John Bolton would have probably voted to convict President Trump. Well, I don't, look, I still don't know all the information about Ukraine or many of these other things. But, but my point is 
that the Democrats made a conscious decision at the beginning of the Ukraine impeachment effort to push Republicans aside. I think there were a lot of Republicans in the House that might have been open to a more reasoned, nonpartisan effort, much like thinking back to Watergate days, what Sam Irvin and Howard Baker did. The Democrats rejected that entirely. They made it a partisan fight in the House. That guaranteed it would be a partisan fight in the Senate, and they lost. That's not a very good strategy. Well, the Democrats say about you that you, your core charge against President Trump is that he put his personal interests consistently over the national interests. They say that's exactly what you've done. Nancy Pelosi and Adam Schiff say that you were choosing greed and loyalty over patriotism. Look, what, what I have chosen is philosophy. I've been a conservative Republican uh, since I was 15 years old and handed out leaflets and rang doorbells for Barry Goldwater in 1964. I've been motivated throughout my government uh, experience to try and advance conservative uh, philosophy. And uh, I think one of the most important things I learned in watching Donald Trump up close uh, is he doesn't have any philosophy. He doesn't proceed on that basis or on the basis of a grand strategy or policy. It's all about Donald Trump. And that, to me, is a lesson for Americans as a whole, but particularly for conservative Republicans, because if Trump wins re-election, which is entirely possible, uh, there's no more guardrail based on what the Republican Party may think about him. So people need to understand that, and I hope if they read the book, they can make up their own minds. But you're not going to vote for President Trump. No, that's right. I will write in a conservative Republican. I haven't decided who yet, but I, that's, that's but my... Let me, uh, let me press you on that, because back in 2016, you called the election a binary choice. You said it basically any vote uh, that is not for Donald Trump is a vote for Hillary Clinton. So is, isn't any vote that is not for, by that logic, any vote that is not for Joe Biden in 2020 a vote for Donald Trump? Well, you, you have accurately characterized what I said in 2016. That was, my, uh, that was my view at the time, no doubt about it. But having watched Donald Trump for 17 months, I cannot in good conscience vote for him. And I think there are a lot of other Republicans who feel the same way. This is not a happy election for conservatives, in my view. But if you write in a conservative, isn't that a vote for Donald Trump, effectively? Well, not in Maryland, where I live. Uh, I think uh, the Democratic nominee will carry Maryland uh, without much trouble. But I want to make it clear, I'm not switching to the Democratic Party. I'm still a rock rib conservative Republican. And in the discussion that will come after the November election within the Republican Party, and it will come whether Trump wins or loses, we have to talk about what the post-Trump party looks like. And I think it's important to set the stage for that conversation, which is in part what I've tried to do in the book. You're national, you were national security advisor to the president of the United States. You served in three Republican administrations, and you warn quite explicitly that if President Trump is reelected, it is dangerous for national security. What is the biggest fear you have? Uh, I served in four Republican administrations. Uh, the, the biggest fear I have is that his policy making is so incoherent, so unfocused, so unstructured, so wrapped around his own uh, personal political fortunes uh, that mistakes are being made that will have grave consequences for the national security uh, of the United States. We've seen this play out in a number of areas already in North Korea, for example, despite two years of an absolutely futile effort to get photo opportunities with Kim Jong-un. The North Koreans within the past couple of weeks have literally blown up the office structures that they built uh, to accommodate South Korean liaison offices. So they are right back uh, to ground zero in terms of the diplomatic effort. And the North Koreans have had two years, two years, to continue to advance their nuclear weapons and ballistic missile capabilities. That is dangerous. President Trump, as you know, has called you a series of names over the last week. Wacko nutjob. We showed some of them earlier. He also explicitly denied one of your most explosive allegations, that he asked President Xi uh, of China for re-election help. He said explicitly, I don't go around saying, oh, help me with my election. Is that true? Uh, I stand by what I said in the book. Uh, as I noted uh, in the extract that was published in the Wall Street Journal, uh, I didn't use the exact words because of the pre-publication review process, but the story is correct. Vanity Fair reports that an unredacted version of your book uh, quoted President Trump saying to she, make sure I win. Is that true? Well, I'm not going to comment on that. I'm going to stick with the, with the language that was approved in the pre-publication review 
uh, process. And let me say, uh, I, I don't know where that leak came from. I don't know where the leak to the New York Times about Ukraine came from back in January. But whoever leaked any of these materials is no friend of mine. You've also confirmed, as we said earlier, the core case, uh, the impeachment case the Democrats made against President Trump, that he explicitly tied aid to Ukraine to those investigations of his political opponents. You knew that at the time. Did Secretary of State Pompeo know that at the time? I, I think it was widely understood. And I want to say uh, all, all of us who were involved in uh, dealing with the national security aspects of Ukraine. I think uniformly we're working to get the assistance delivered. We were, we were running up against a September 30 end of fiscal year deadline and there was real urgency uh, not to lose that assistance because of the bureaucratic rules about budget allocations. Uh, and, and that was the focus. The only uh, person in the White House that I'm aware of that didn't focus on the national security implications for Ukraine was Donald Trump. The Secretary of State has also said, you're the liar here. He's, uh, he says, yeah, I was in the room, too, in a statement he put out. You've spread a number of lies, fully spun half-truths, and outright falsehoods, including what one, one story you tell in the book is that you and the Secretary of State are in Singapore, and he shows you his notepad, essentially saying the president is full of something I can't repeat on morning television. Look, it's true. Uh, I think he is responding the same way that President Trump is. They call names, they deny, but, uh, but they're not willing to face up to what the real facts are. Look, people have different recollections. I've been a trial lawyer. I've seen it, many witnesses over time. I've put 500 pages of, of what I saw the facts to be out on the table. I think it's important that the American people have these facts as they consider what to do in November and as we look at our history. Uh, and see Trump for what I hope history will record it to be, an aberration. Federal judge is allowing you to, to, to sell your book, but he's also warning that you may not get any profits from it. He said, you gambled with the national security of the United States. You've exposed the country to harm and yourself to civil and potentially criminal liability. What's your response to Judge Lamberth? Well, we respectfully disagree with that. There's a story to tell here, uh, and we're going to be telling it uh, as the evidence comes out. Uh, the president made very clear three or four months ago he wanted to suppress this book. Now, just think about that. It's, a, it's on the pretext of national security information, but the president's not worried about foreigners reading this book. He's worried about the and American people reading this book. Finally, sir, you, you say the obstruction of justice is a way of life in the Trump White House. Is that what we've seen this weekend with the president's firing of the U.S. attorney here in New York, Jeffrey Berman? You know, I, I'm obviously I've been out of the government since September. I don't know what the facts are here. I really would rather not speculate on that. John Bolton, thanks very much. Your book, The Room Where It Happened, is out. If the book gets out, he's broken the law, and I would think that he would have criminal problems. This is the book that President Trump does not want the American people to read. And maybe he's not telling the truth. He's been known not to tell the truth a lot. John Bolton is the highest ranking official to write an insider account of his experience inside Trump's White House. Why is this the book President Trump doesn't want anyone to read? Because this is a book of facts. So why wouldn't President Trump want to know about those facts? Because I think it shows a pattern quite contrary to the image he would like to convey of the decisive president who knows something about what he's doing. Bolton has been defined by fierce ideology. He was once ambassador to the United Nations and served three previous Republican presidents. He is an aggressive promoter of a hawkish, strong projection of American power around the world. Many of us thought that Bolton going in with that portfolio, there could be some conflict. On April 9, 2018, Bolton started his job as Trump's third national security advisor in less than 15 months. Breaking right now, John Bolton is in. Good news as national security advisor. John Bolton's the right guy at the right time. I think he's going to be a fantastic representative of our team. He's highly respected by everybody in this room. You are going to do a fantastic job, and I appreciate you joining us. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. But John Bolton is about to join a revolving door of advisors. 
Let's go back. So you walk into the White House. You'd worked for three other presidents, both Bushes and Reagan. What was immediately different about the Trump White House? This was not like a White House I had ever seen before. Uh, it was not functioning uh, in the same way as any of the three previous presidents I had worked for. From his first day in office, Trump was a president unlike any other. We are not going to let the fake news tell us what to do. Unpredictable and often incendiary. If you're not happy here, then you can leave. That's what I said in a tweet, which I guess some people think is controversial. A lot of people love it, by the way. Donald Trump is a reality TV star turned president of the United States of America. He likes the TV moments. He also thrives on chaos. Is that your Bible? It's a Bible. Even the daily schedule at the White House was unorthodox. What most people found striking was that Trump's official day didn't start until almost lunchtime. Trump was not loafing during the morning. He talked to all manner of people. Who were those outsiders he was listening to? I don't really know. I think they were friends. Sometimes he would say a very wise person told me X or uh, somebody who really knows this stuff told me Y. What were his briefings like? Was he reading his briefings? Well, my experience was he very rarely read much. The uh, intelligence briefings took place perhaps once or twice a week. Uh, Is that unusual? It's very unusual. They should take place every day. The president should read extensively the material he's given. It's not clear to me that he read much of anything. There was just a, uh, an unwillingness on the part of the president, I think, to do systematic learning so that he could make the most informed decisions. I'm a very stable genius. The president has referred to himself as a stable genius. Is that what you saw? Really? Well, how can anybody call himself a stable genius? He did say it a couple times when I was in his presence, and I just uh, didn't react to it. You wrote the president was not just uninformed, but stunningly uninformed. Can you give us some examples? Well, there were things that we went over again and again and again that just didn't seem to sink in, like why was the Korean Peninsula partitioned in 1945 at the end of World War II, and what did that lead to, and how did we get to that point? You say in the book that Trump asked General John Kelly, if Finland was part of Russia? He said those things, absolutely. And when you're dealing with somebody who asks questions like that, it's very hard to know how to proceed. Would you say anything to him about this? Well, you don't, you don't uh, necessarily say to any president, you know, Mr. President, you really got to buckle down here and do your lessons. So, no, I didn't do it that way. I certainly uh, tried on a couple of occasions uh, with, I think, success from time to time. From the beginning, the Trump White House was a family affair. Both his son-in-law, Jared, and his daughter, Ivanka, hold key positions as his advisors. They even have a disparaging nickname. They call them Javanka because they're sort of seen as one in the same. Somebody once said to me, in the Trump White House, there's family and everyone else is the help. Who held the most power in the White House? It varied from time to time, but I think the sustained answer to that question over time uh, is Jared Kushner. Thank you, Jared. My star. He is so great. If you can't produce peace in the Middle East, nobody can. Jared Kushner deals with everything. Think about it. When it comes to Middle East peace, Jared, you deal with that. When it comes to dealing with China, Jared, you take the lead on that. When it came to the coronavirus pandemic, Suddenly, there he was again. Jared Kushner has a very broad portfolio. Is he the most qualified person for those jobs? I don't, I re don't really want to get into the, to the family aspect of this. The focus ought to be on the president. But if Jared Kushner is the second most powerful person in that White House, why can't you answer that question? Well, I think uh, a question I would put in turn to conservative Republicans is, how do you feel about that? While reluctant to get personal about the Trump family in our interview, Bolton did share a story about the president and his daughter after news broke of Ivanka's private email account. Ivanka Trump under fire, accused of doing exactly what her own father campaigned against, using a private email account to conduct government business. You share one story of how policy was essentially shaped to protect the Trump family interest after U.S. intelligence reportedly determined the Saudi crown prince played a role in the killing of Jamal Khashoggi. Trump issued a statement, you say, to divert attention from Ivanka, who was getting press for her emails, her private email account. 
Well, the president said that. Now, in fact, he also strongly believed in the statement that he made about U.S. policy vis-a-vis -vis Saudi Arabia despite the killing of Khashoggi because of the arms sales relationship and other things. But it was very much on his mind that day that his daughter was taking some heavy hits in the press and absolutely guaranteed this diverted everyone's attention. And he said that? Yes. But what's garnered a lot of attention is Bolton's assertion that he saw a disturbing pattern behind the president's decision-making process. You say that you were astonished by what you saw. A president for whom getting reelected was the only thing that mattered, even if it meant endangering or weakening the nation? Well, I think he was so focused on the reelection that longer-term considerations fell by the wayside. There was considerable emphasis on the photo opportunity and the press reaction to it, and little or no focus on what such meetings did for the bargaining position of the United States. Are you saying that all decisions the president made were driven by re-election? Thank you very much, El Paso. Thank you very much. I didn't see anything where that wasn't the major factor. So a lot of people have complained that he has a short attention span and he doesn't focus. I want to say when it comes to re-election, his attention span was infinite. It's just too bad there wasn't more of that when it came to national security. You described the president as erratic, foolish, behaved irrationally, bizarrely. You can't leave him alone for a minute. He saw conspiracies behind rocks. He couldn't tell the difference between his personal interests and the country's interests. I don't think he's fit for office. I, I don't think he has the competence to carry out the job. There really isn't any guiding principle that I was able to discern other than what's good for Donald Trump's reelection. Next here, the ABC News exclusive, now just hours away, are Martha Raddatz sitting down with former National Security Advisor John Bolton, pressing him on damning new allegations against President Trump in his new book and why he's going public now. One thing is clear, the president's allies and his enemies will all be watching very closely. Here's our chief global affairs correspondent, Martha Raddatz. Tonight, in just hours, the full story of John Bolton's explosive new book. Bolton, who served President Trump longer than any of his national security advisors, saying he was deeply disturbed by Trump's actions in the White House. You also use the phrase in the book that Trump's pattern looked like obstruction of justice as a way of life, which we couldn't accept. Obstruction of justice as a way of life? Look, these were things that I could see some evidence of, and they bothered me greatly. I talked to uh, the attorney general about them. I talked to the counsel to the president about them. I've talked to other members of the cabinet about them uh, and uh, relayed my concerns, and they, they were very much on my mind. A federal judge refusing the Justice Department's request to block the memoir, the room where it happened, although the judge admonishing the former National Security Advisor for likely publishing classified materials, a claim Bolton disputes. The book, being released Tuesday, accuses the president of being erratic, irrational, and foolish. I don't think he's fit for office. I, I don't think he has the competence to carry out the job. There really isn't any guiding principle uh, that I was able to discern other than uh, what's good for Donald Trump's reelection. President Trump blasting Bolton, saying he broke the law and will pay a big price in possible losses of book profits and potential criminal charges. Today, Democrats and Republicans questioned why Bolton never sought to testify in House impeachment hearings. For $29.95, he could monetize his national security clearance, but under oath, he would have had an opportunity to answer questions and not just make assertions. But now, some Democrats say they will investigate any further allegations of wrongdoing raised in the book. I don't think we should wait uh, if we conclude that uh, there are important things that he says that need to be exposed to the public. The public needs to know exactly what they have in this president. What is also clear from the interview with John Bolton is that he wanted that book out before the election. Whit? Martha, thank you. And a reminder, you can see Martha Raddatz in that exclusive interview with John Bolton and the explosive allegations he's making against the president in an ABC News special tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern. The fall this morning after Robert Mueller's marathon testimony. Seven hours of questions from two committees. And that caused President Trump to declare victory. Big question now, what comes next here on the Hill? 
So the Mueller testimony is behind us. And the very next morning, little did we know that Donald Trump was on the phone with the Ukrainian leader doing what appeared to be what was really related to that central question of the Mueller report, seeming to invite foreign interference in a U.S. election. Ukraine seems an unlikely place as a battleground to imperil an American presidency. But that is exactly what happened in 2019. It was, in a very real sense, the day President Trump's impeachment began. You've never spoken publicly about what happened last year, but you wrote that you, Ukraine was a perfect example of Trump working for his own best personal interests. Explain. He wanted uh, a probe of Joe Biden in exchange for delivering the uh, security assistance that was part of the uh, congressional legislation that uh, had been passed uh, several years before. So that in his mind, uh, he was bargaining to get the investigation using the resources of the federal government, which I found very disturbing. It began with that phone call, the president of the United States to the president of Ukraine. Compliments, goodwill, then a request, a favor. According to the transcript, the president says the following. I would like you to do us a favor, though, because our country has been through a lot and Ukraine knows a lot about it. I would like to have the attorney general call you or your people, and I would like you to get to the bottom of it. There's a lot of talk about Biden's son, that Biden stopped the prosecution. A lot of people want to find out about that. The conversation that I had was absolutely perfect, and most people that have read it say the same thing. The linkage between the military assistance and uh, and, and that uh, opportunity to go after Joe Biden didn't emerge immediately. But I could see that the issue was there. He said it to me directly, that that's what he had in mind. And I'll say again, I think it was widely understood at senior levels in the government that that's exactly what his objective was. Can you tell us who else understood that? I think Secretary Pompeo understood, the Pentagon understood, intelligence community understood, people in the White House understood. The president wasn't shy in voicing the view of the Ukraine uh, that, that that's what he wanted. It, it turned out not to be a convictable, impeachable offense, but it's something the American people ought to take a look at, as they should the other examples. He focused on terms like China buying more agricultural products, uh, which he said to Xi Jinping directly would help him in the farm states. A really, to me, stunning statement by a president uh, to the leader of an adversarial foreign country. So you're saying that if the Democrats had looked at what you call a broader pattern of behavior, then there might have been a greater chance to persuade others that high crimes and misdemeanors had been perpetrated. I think the example of Ukraine uh, could well amount to it. As for the others, they require more investigation. For Ukraine, almost $400 million in aid was frozen. Bolton says Trump told him directly it was waiting for an investigation of Biden's son and the Democrats. August 20th comes a key conversation you had with President Trump about the security assistance. What exactly did the president say to you? Well, he directly linked the provision of that assistance with the investigation. The New York Times reported on that August conversation and the president denied it, tweeting, I never told John Bolton that the aid to Ukraine was tied to investigations into Democrats, including the Bidens. Is the president lying? Yes, he is. Uh, and it's not the first time either. I think it's important to get these kinds of facts out on the table. And I don't think President Trump really fears what foreign governments are going to read in the book. He fears what the American people are going to read. The question was, was the president looking for a quid pro quo, this for that? It was hotly denied by the president. There was no quid pro quo. There was no quid pro quo. There was no quid pro quo. Please rise. Many in Congress wanted to hear what Bolton had to say during Trump's impeachment. Bolton has said that he would testify. To have Ambassador Bolton testify under oath. John Bolton has a... Uh, relevant uh, testimony. And the Senate must have him testify as a witness. This would have been the president's national security advisor, former national security advisor, would have been giving a first-hand account of his version of the facts. But Bolton didn't speak. You were a star witness to something the president was on trial for, something you say you now find deeply disturbing, possibly criminal, yet you felt no obligation at all to tell the American people about this, whether in testimony on the Hill or an interview 
or a statement or anything? I was fully prepared if I got a subpoena. I think the way the House advocates of impeachment proceeded uh, was badly wrong. I think it was impeachment malpractice. You could have been that person providing that testimony. And it would not have made any difference. How but can you say that? Because How do you mines, know? Because mines were made up on Capitol Hill. But you, you're also saying, had they looked at, it was too narrow, they were just looking at Ukraine, and they should have looked at all these things that you're outlining in the book. If they didn't know about those things from you, how could they do that? Because a, an impeachment process that was serious and not partisan, like Watergate, would have taken the time to cover all these areas. They failed utterly to accomplish what they wanted. In fact, they made things worse because their strategy fitted with the Trump political strategy. Keep it narrow and move it fast. But now he is bringing it all out and getting paid for putting it in a book. You could have told these stories when you were in the White House or when the impeachment trial was going on and you chose instead to do it in a book. Because I didn't think the Democrats had the wit or the political understanding or the reach to change what for them was an exercise in arousing their own base so that they could say we impeach Donald Trump. The Democrats can pursue whatever policy they want. They don't dictate to me how best to bring this to the attention of the American people. But you can certainly understand why your critics say why didn't he come forward before? Why is he making a profit on this now. You know, it has, it has nothing to do with making a profit. It has everything to do with making sure that the constitutional responsibilities that are accorded the different branches of government are carried out the right way. In his impeachment trial, President Trump was acquitted. Bolton by then no longer worked for his administration. The House advocates said, we have proven Trump is impeached forever and that he'd learn a lesson from it absolutely 180 degrees the opposite of the truth. He didn't learn lessons from it other than that he could get away with it, which leaves only the last guardrail uh, is the election this November. North Korea, the most secretive nation on the planet, fueled by power, loyalty, and greed. From its million-man military to its eerie forced conformity, a nation living in fear. The best way to understand North Korea is that it's a 25 million person prison camp and it's ruled by the world's only hereditary communist dictatorship. Kim Jong-un, known as supreme leader to his people, an international outlaw to much of the world. North Korea is a poor country, people starve there, and yet for decades this regime has spent untold amounts of money developing this nuclear and ballistic missile program. This is the heart of their power. You have always been a hardliner on North Korea, and yet there you were with the president who wanted to meet with Kim Jong-un. What concerns did you have about that? Well, I was very concerned that he would give away things that he didn't need to give away. To be clear, I don't think North Korea is ever going to voluntarily give up its nuclear weapons program. For decades, North Korea has been building up its nuclear arsenal. North Korea is a situation that should have been handled 25 years ago, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, but I'll fix the mess. So when Kim launched a long-range missile that could potentially reach the United States with a nuclear weapon, Trump went ballistic. And we begin with North Korea. President Trump warning the regime today against making any more threats toward the U.S. North Korea better get their act together or they're going to be in trouble like few nations ever have been in trouble. The president had a nickname for the dictator. Rocket Man. Rocket Man. Little Rocket Man. And a warning. Rocket Man is on a suicide mission for himself and for his regime. Kim Jong-un is saying equally incendiary things out of North Korea, and he's testing increasingly sophisticated uh, rockets capable of delivering nuclear weapons. He has been very threatening uh, beyond a normal statement. And as I said, they will be met with fire, fury, and frankly, power, the likes of which this world has never seen before. It was a very dangerous, very unsettled time. I was really being tough, and so was he. And we were going back and forth, and then we fell in love. 
Okay. Kim sent the president an oversized love letter. He wrote me beautiful letters, and they're great letters. It was the beginning of the bromance. Do you think he really believes that Kim Jong-un loves him? Uh, I, I don't know any other explanation. I think Kim Jong-un gets a huge laugh out of this. I mean, these letters are written by some functionary in the North Korean Workers' Party agitprop office. And yet the president uh, has looked at them as evidence of this deep friendship. Even if it were a deep personal relationship, it doesn't change the fact Kim Jong-un is never going to give up his nuclear weapons program. But nobody should misunderstand that a personal relationship is somehow equivalent uh, to, uh, to, to better relations between the two nations. We make a deal. I think Kim Jong-un is going to be very, very happy. I really believe he's going to be very happy. When the two leaders met for the first time in Singapore for their historic summit, it was high theater. Donald Trump wanted to put on the foreign policy show of a lifetime. He saw the American flags flying next to the North Korean flags, Kim Jong-un coming from one side of the stage, Donald Trump coming from the other, smiling like they had been old friends. Why is this diplomatic initiative so important to President Trump? When we were in Singapore, one of the things he said over and over again uh, was to ask how many press people were going to be present for his final press conference. And I think the final number, it was a very large number, as it should have been. 400, 500. By the time we left Singapore, he was at 2,000. That's what he was focused on, that he had had this enormous photo opportunity. Uh, first time an American president has met with the leader of North Korea. John Bolton saw the bargaining firsthand behind closed doors. In this photo, see him in the lower right corner. He is there in the room where it happened. Take us inside that room. The press mob, as you call them, comes in. As soon as they leave, you say the flattery began with Kim Jong-un. Well, every president has a style, but the idea that uh, just this oleogenous uh, layer of uh, compliments to this brutal dictator would convince him that you could make a deal with Donald Trump, I thought was both strikingly naive and dangerous. He told Kim Jong-un we would give up what he called the war games on the Korean Peninsula. The president didn't seem to understand that the war games, as he called them, were critical to American and South Korean ability to be ready to withstand pressure from North Korea. And to pull down these engagements, these uh, exercises, because they displease Kim Jong-un, I just thought was an act of folly. Just a month before that summit, you praised the president's skill, saying he would size Kim up and that he has got an outstanding ability to do that. Did you believe that when you said it? Not particularly, but you know, one of the functions of, uh, of an administration official uh, is to defend the administration. The summit was over, but the bromance was in full bloom. Trump's nickname for Kim Jong-un was Rocket Man. Well, we, he, he gave him a, an Elton John CD. I tried to explain that calling him Rocket Man was actually a compliment. I don't think we've heard from Kim Jong-un what he thought of Elton John's song, but that would, that'll be an interesting tidbit in history. But this is the kind of focus that leads you to wonder whether the, there's an ability to discern what's cosmetic here from what's truly serious. And you think what he did there is dangerous? I think when you're dealing with the power of nuclear weapons, in the hands of an irrational regime, not taking that as seriously as he should have was a big mistake. Donald Trump got a lot. The U.S. itself got nothing from that. The United States gave much more legitimacy uh, to this dictator uh, and didn't accomplish anything toward any meaningful discussion on the elimination of their nuclear weapons program. Did you tell him at any time about the things you're now telling the world? Well, I, I certainly tried to. I, I said at one point, Mr. President, he's the dictator of a rat little country that doesn't deserve a meeting with you. The president's response to that was, you know, you have a lot of hostility. 
Of course, I have more hostility, but you have a lot of hostility. They would meet twice more. Trump walking away from a summit in Hanoi as Kim's demands hardened. Sometimes you have to walk, and uh, this was just one of those times. Only to show up months later at the DMZ. Trump becoming the first American president to step into North Korea. Would you like me to step across? I'd be very proud to do that. Okay. But Trump's high stakes gamble has gotten him nowhere with denuclearization. The man who brought us the art of the deal failing to secure one. As we sit here today, would you say the threat from North Korea is greater today than when President Trump took office? The threat from North Korea today is absolutely greater because while all these photo opportunities were taking place, there's absolutely no doubt that North Korea's work on both its nuclear and ballistic missile programs continued. So on a scale of 1 to 10, how would you rate Trump's ability to make a deal in North Korea? Well, I think it turned out clearly at this point to be zero. It's not that hard to make a deal if you're prepared to give away enough. And if you don't fully appreciate what it is you're giving away, or the nature of the adversary negotiating on the other side of the table, you can make some pretty serious mistakes. Condi Rice, George W. Bush's national security advisor and secretary of state said to me, Putin only knows two ways to deal with people, to humiliate them or dominate them, and you can't let him get away with it. How would you describe Trump's relationship with Vladimir Putin? I think Putin is smart, tough, I think he sees that uh, he's not faced with a serious adversary here. I think Putin thinks he can play him like a fiddle. I don't think he's worried about Donald Trump. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Moscow. In the years before he was president, Donald Trump brought his Miss Universe pageant to Russia. And of course, the big man on campus, Donald Trump hoping that President Putin would attend. Through the years, his interest in Russia and Putin continued up to the 2016 election. I mean, he might be bad, he might be good, but he's a strong leader. But it was this comment on the campaign trail that raised questions. Russia, if you're listening, I hope you're able to find the 30,000 emails that are missing. He essentially called on Russia to hack into Hillary Clinton's emails. By the way, if they hacked, they probably have her 33,000 emails. I hope they do. Since he took office, Trump and Putin have shared a complicated relationship. Putin struck me as totally in control, calm, self-confident, totally knowledgeable on Moscow's national security priorities. You say that President Putin plays Donald Trump like a fiddle. How does he do it? He knows the people he's talking to, uh, and I think he looks at somebody like Donald Trump and says to himself, uh, as an old KGB officer, how am I going to get him to the place I want him to be? And I, I can just see the smirk when he knows he's got him following his line. Well, actually, Putin did call me a genius, and he said, I'm the future of the Republican Party. So. He's off to a good start. You wrote that on a few occasions, President Trump was eager or even desperate, as you describe it, to meet with Vladimir Putin. Well, I think there, were, there was the same fascination uh, with speaking with a leader like Putin that we uh, saw with respect to the Kim Jong-un. The president himself used to comment on it, how strange it was that uh, in, in uh, one trip he took to a NATO summit so that he thought the easiest, most pleasant one might be with Vladimir Putin. July 2018, and the two men were about to meet at a high-profile summit in Finland. Great to be with you. So here you have the president going to meet with Vladimir Putin as the world has seen the evidence that people that work in Vladimir Putin's government were directly involved in the hack of the Democratic Party emails during the 2016 campaign. So it's an incredible cloud over this meeting of these two men. Donald Trump, as we say, sees himself as a deal maker. What happened to the deal maker in those situations? Well, the president uh, may well be a superb deal maker when it comes to Manhattan real estate. But when you're dealing with somebody like Putin who has made his life 
understanding Russia's strategic position in the world uh, against Donald Trump, who doesn't enjoy reading about these issues or learning about them. Uh, it's a very difficult position for America to be in. I love to negotiate things. I do it really well and all that stuff. Trump was not following any international grand strategy. His thinking was like an archipelago of dots, leaving the rest of us to discern or create policy. I would assume that Donald Trump would come back and say, look, we, we put very serious sanctions on Russia and that he has been good with Donald Trump and you need to have good relationships. Certainly personal relationships between leaders are important, but they do not dominate what the national interests are. And I think Putin has a very acute knowledge of what Russia's national interests are uh, and how he wants to accomplish them. You were worried about leaving him alone in a room with Vladimir Putin. Why? Because I didn't know what he would say. The president has said this will put him in a bad position with world leaders. If you were president, you certainly wouldn't want your former national security advisor to be saying that the Russian president could play you like a fiddle. Why does that not matter as he goes forward? Well, it's not telling Vladimir Putin anything that he doesn't already know. Uh, and it, it's telling the American people something they may not be aware of. At the end of the summit, Trump and Putin held a press conference that would make headlines around the world. President Trump and Vladimir Putin have just concluded their one-on-one -on -one meeting. During today's meeting, I addressed directly with President Putin the issue of Russian interference in our elections. I felt this was a message best delivered in person. You said you were frozen in your seat watching that. I, 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 I thought I wouldn't get up. I didn't know what to do. My people came to me, Dan Coates came to me and some others. They said they think it's Russia. Uh, I have uh, President Putin. Uh, he just said it's not Russia. I will say this. I don't see any reason why it would be. We had the famous press conference and the equivalency that the president described. He says because he was misunderstood to uh, what our intelligence was saying about Russian interference in American elections and Vladimir Putin's denial. It was it was a stunning moment. Well, so I have great confidence in my intelligence people, but uh, I will tell you that President Putin was extremely strong and powerful in his denial today. History was made. The reverberations were immediate. The president clearly appearing to choose Putin. You think President Trump did not like to talk about election interference? Oh, I definitely think he did not like talking about election interference because he made what I viewed as the mistake of believing that if he accepted that the Russians had intervened in the 2016 election, that it legitimized the narrative that they had intervened to help him hurt Hillary Clinton and that he would not have won without the Russian interference. I think Vladimir Putin and their strategy rest on the real perception that American politics today is very fraught, very tense, very difficult. Everything they can do to stir mistrust to undercut the legitimacy of our democratic institutions uh, helps to paralyze America. And a weaker, more paralyzed, more divided America is in Russia's interest. They're having great success at it. I think many of these foreign leaders uh, uh, mastered the art of ringing his bells. You say the term, he was marked by some of those leaders. I think they knew exactly what they were looking at. And, they pursue their objectives, and this, this is, in my view, the only way you can pursue a successful policy is persistently uh, with the eye on your ultimate objective and taking Trump apart piece by piece by piece, uh, which I'm afraid uh, too often was the case.